بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. إن شاء الله continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. السيرة النبوية, the prophetic biography. In the, <coughs> excuse me, in the last few sessions we've been talking about the um, conquest of Mecca, فتح مكة, the opening of the city of Mecca. And we talked about it in a lot of detail and we covered all the different aspects of it, how it exactly transpired, what it led up to it, uh, the different um, events or the different conversations, the really remarkable things that occurred that transpired in the course of it. And what we're going to be talking about today, inshallah, we're moving on to the next major event. And this is also in the eighth year of Hijrah, the eighth year of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, eight years after his migration to the city of Medina. And this is towards the end of the eighth year. So to quickly uh, recap and remember where we exactly left off, the Prophet wasallam, along with the forces of about 12,000 of the Muslims, they arrived in the city of Mecca about halfway through the month of Ramadan. The Prophet wasallam, then along with his companions, remained in the city of Mecca for the remainder of the month of Ramadan. And it is at this particular time, about five days into the month of Shawwal. Some of the narrations, some of the commentators, they mentioned, it was six days into the month of Shawwal, but that's give or take uh, just a day. So about five days into the following month. So this is about 20 days, a little over maybe 20 days, 22 days, after the conquest of Mecca, the Prophet Sallallahu and the Muslims have been in Mecca. Mecca has been well secured, well established. People have accepted Islam, given the oath of allegiance to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has to quite an extent, very effectively established order, peace within the city of Mecca. And many of the other threats that existed in and around the city of Mecca have been neutralized. We talked about the Prophet Sallallahu sending out Khalid bin Walid radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, on a campaign to basically further secure uh, the city of Mecca and its surrounding regions, its surrounding areas. It is at this particular time, as I said, five days into the following month, the month of Shawwal, the 10th month of the lunar calendar. So this is towards the tail end of the eighth year of Hijrah. At this particular time, there is a little bit of movement a, a, a ways away from the city of Mecca. And that movement, what it was, was that there were some Bedouin tribes. So the city of Ta'if, the city of Ta'if is about 67 miles away from the city of Mecca. Now, obviously that's not as close as we consider 67 miles, right? But at the same time, it's not that far either. So while it is a significant enough of a journey, it would take somebody a couple of days to get from Mecca to Ta'if, you know, uh, in those days, it's still considered not very, very distant. It's close enough. And between the city of Mecca and the city of Ta'if, there are some different Bedouin tribes that reside therein. And they're typically known as Qaba'il Hawazin, the tribes of Hawazin. That's what they're known as. So those tribes of Hawazin, some of them started to congregate together and started to gather together, hearing the news of the fall of the city of Mecca and the fact that Islam had come to the city of Mecca and been embraced in fact by the city of Mecca and the people of Mecca. Many of the different tribes of Hawazin, these Bedouin tribes, scattered tribes, they started to congregate together and started to try to form an alliance. And the narration, the historical narrations, Ibn Ishaq, he mentions that some of the tribes such as um, Nasr, Jusham, Sa'ad bin Bakr, and some of the people of Banu Hilal, these are some of the different scattered tribes of Hawazin, they started to congregate together. And they started to basically get together for the purpose of mounting and launching an assault and attack against the Muslims. And when news of this small little group, and the, Ibn Ishaq mentions, وَهُمْ قَلِيلٌ It was still a fairly small group. Um, because there were many other of the smaller tribes within that region that chose not to join in with this new formed alliance, newly formed alliance. Some of the tribes of Qays Ailan 
and uh, Banu Ka'ab, Banu Kilab, and many others, they decided not to join in with this. So it was a, not a very minuscule, but nevertheless, fairly speaking, generally speaking, it was a fairly small alliance. But when the people in Ta'if, and Ta'if was home to the second largest tribe in Arabia, in the Arabian Peninsula, after the Quraysh, which was Banu Thaqif. When the people of Banu, and Banu Thaqif and Quraysh had a rivalry that went back generations, centuries. Uh, in fact, if you recall, when we talk about the story of the attack by the army of the elephants, Ashab al Fil, um, it is the people of Thaqif, the people of Ta'if, who actually tried to stab the Meccans, the Quraysh, in the back. And basically, you know, were willing to give their loyalty and their allegiance to Abraha. So there was a long standing rivalry between Mecca and Ta'if. So Banu Thaqif, when they hear, okay, there are some forces that are gathering together in order to fight off, you know, the Muslims, particularly now that the Quraysh has joined the Muslims. Banu Thaqif came and joined them as well. Now Banu Thaqif, the Ta'if people, they had a decent number. And once they came and joined, then it became a decent group. Again, not a very large group, not nearly the size of the Muslims, as we'll talk about a little bit later on. It basically came out to be about a third of the size of the Muslim army. There were about 4,000 of them, but it was a decent enough of a group. So they came together, and they gathered together to basically launch this attack against the Muslims. And before I proceed on to talk about how the Prophet ﷺ learned about this and what was the Prophet ﷺ's reaction and response to this, before I move to that, what I wanted to share is just some of the mindset of these, the, the, the people of Hawazin particularly, that had gathered together to fight the Muslims. So there's a very specific, uh, Ibn Ishaq mentions, there's a very specific conversation that he relates and he recalls from here, that when they gathered together, when they congregated together all the forces, one of the people who had come from Thaqif, he asked one of the leaders of Hawazin, those small tribes that had gathered together, he says that, um, he says, Mali asma'u riga al ba'iri wa nuhaq al hamiri wa buka al sagiri wa yu'ar al sha'i. He says, Why is it that I hear camels and horses and cows and babies and, and goats and sheep? Like, why, why, why? This sounds like a village. Why does your army camp when the people of Thaqif arrived? They asked the people of Hawazin, why does your encampment sound more like a village than an army encampment? Right? We hear people, children, women, you know, goats and sheep and things like that. Like why? Why is that the case? So one of the leaders of Hawazin, he says that Saqa Malik ibn Awf ma'an nasi amwalahum wa nisa'ahum wa abna'ahum. He said one of the leaders of Hawazin, Malik ibn Awf, he told the people to bring their uh, bring their, their animals, to bring their wives, to bring their children, basically to bring their families and bring their animals along with them. Like the whole village should come. And he says that, Aina Malik, where's Malik? I need to talk to him about this. So he says, they have a Malik, he's over there, they called Malik up. And he said, Ya Malik, innaka qad asbahta ra'isa qawmik. He says, look, you are the leader of your people. You are the leader of your people. So I need you to inna hada yawmun ka'inun lahu ma ba'dahu min al-ayyam. And he says that this that this event, this attack that we're preparing for, this is a really significant thing. Then why is it that your encampment looks like a village? Why do I hear women and children? Why do I see goats and sheep and chickens running around? Like what's going on here? So he says that سُقْتُ مَعَ النَّاسِ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ وَنِسَاءَهُمْ وَمْوَالَهُمْ I told people to bring their families and bring their animals. He says, Lima, why would you do such a thing? He says, أَرَدْتُ أَنْ أَجْعَلَ خَلْفَ كُلَّ رَجُلٍ كُلِّ رَجُلٍ أَهْلَهُ وَمَالَهُ لِيُقَاتِلَ عَنْهُمْ He says that when I present my soldiers, when I put my soldiers forward to fight, what I'm going to do is I'm going to line up all their families behind them so that when they fight, they know that they're fighting not just for themselves, they're fighting to protect the lives of their family members. 
So the, there was a very kind of twisted mentality and a very twisted mindset. And the narrations kind of go on that they had a lot of conversations where they said that, look, if you win, you win, that's fine. But if you lose, you put, themselves, put them in a situation where everyone and everything will perish. And they were willing to just kind of sacrifice their people this way. So, and I, and I mentioned this for a couple of reasons. Number one, you see the twisted mindset. And you see kind of the desperation. And the at all costs mentality that these people had. Versus, this is something very significant. The ethics of the Prophet wasallam was that, and this is something that is well established in the principles of Islamic law, in usul al-fiqh, in our usul, is something well established, that we have certain actions that are admirable in and of themselves. And then we have certain actions that are not desirable in and of themselves, but, and then furthermore, we then sometimes have situations, scenarios, where actions that are normally speaking, in and of themselves, not desirable, not admirable, they're not sought out, they sometimes can become necessary, almost like what we call in, in just common speech, a necessary evil, due to the circumstances. And yes, Warfare, fighting is something that the Qur'an mentions. It's something that did occur in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. But it is still at the same time a well-established part of our Qur'anic, prophetic, Islamic tradition that warfare, fighting, battle is something that is detestable. قَبِيحٌ لِذَاتِهِ It is detestable in and of itself. It is not something we seek out. It is not something that we admire. It is not something that we pursue. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, لا تتمنوا لقاء العدو Do not want to face the enemy in the battlefield. Don't seek that out. Do not seek out war. بَلْ سَلُوا اللَّهَ الْعَافِيَةِ The Prophet ﷺ said, rather always seek safety, well-being, protection, sanctity of life, preservation of life and property. Always seek that out. And then the Prophet ﷺ goes on to say, فَإِذَا لَقِيْتُمُوهُمْ فَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ الْجَنَّةَ تَحْتَ ظِلَالِ السُّيُوفِ But if you do happen to find yourself in that situation, against, you know, your best efforts, you find yourself in that situation, then know that paradise lies under the shade of the swords. Like then it's, it's time for valor, then it's time for bravery, then it's time to put your best foot forward. So there's no cowardice. But at the same time, we would be remiss not to very clearly establish the idea that that is not something we seek out, it's not something we pursue. And secondly, even in the circumstance, in the situation, where that necessary evil arrives, that moment arrives, the Prophet ﷺ had a remarkable amount of ethics about warfare. Where the Prophet ﷺ said that in no scenario, at no cost, do we ever enter women and children into the fray? We do not kill women and children, we do not present them into the battlefield. Yes, it's found in the Hadith of Bukhari and in the authentic narrations that there were sometimes like our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha who was seen in the battlefield, but what was she doing? She was in the, behind the battlefield, behind you know, where the action was taking place, providing water, nursing the wounded, the injured. That's something else. But in the battle itself, in the fighting itself, never ever. Women and children, we do not ever subject them to warfare. We don't use them as ploys in battle. And the Prophet ﷺ forbade the killing of, the, 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 the senseless killing of animals. They haven't done anything. The Prophet ﷺ forbade, you know, burning things down and pillaging and just raising things to the ground, whether it be, you know, nature or whether it even be construction. We just don't destroy things for the sake of destroying them. He forbade all of this. The Prophet ﷺ forbade striking elderly people in the battlefield. And so all of these ethics were always preserved. Think about all the difficult situations the Muslims found themselves in. Up until this point. Whether it be Badr, whether it be Uhud, whether it be Khandaq. All of these moments, none of those lines were ever crossed. None of those principles were ever violated, ever compromised. This is something that's very noteworthy, and I wanted to mention this for this particular reason. Now, at this particular time, once, the, so the, how did the Prophet ﷺ come to find out that these forces are gathering? 
So there's multiple narrations. Ibn Ishaq, he mentions that when the Prophet ﷺ heard some chatter, he heard some news that there seems to be some movement a little ways away from the city of Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ sent a sahabi, his name is Abdullah ibn Abi Hadrad al-Aslami. He's more f- popularly known, more famously known as Ibn Abi Hadrad. The Prophet ﷺ sent him. And he told him he was a very kind of discreet, you know, inconspicuous individual. And so the Prophet ﷺ told him to very quietly, very calmly, very casually go out there, see what's going on, go and kind of blend into the people, mix and mingle and kind of find out exactly what's happening, and then bring the information back. And that's also very, very important to make sure that there is not any type of brash action that is taken. But every action needs to be deliberate. And there needs to be great deliberation and thoughtfulness and planning and strategy in any action that is taken. Lives are at stake. We just talked about it in the pre- previous uh, session or the session before that when Khalid bin Walid radiallahu ta'ala anhu took some very kind of brash action, the Prophet ﷺ was very upset and very, very, um, just very upset at what he had done. And the Prophet ﷺ reprimanded him for that action. And the Prophet ﷺ made amends for that action. So nevertheless, he goes and he stays there and he finds everything out. And he specifically hears Malik bin Auf, the leader that I talked about who was kind of heading this, this army, this, fourth, this force that had gathered together. He heard exactly him kind of barking out orders and kind of you know, organizing the troops and laying out the strategy and the plans. And at this particular time, once the news was confirmed that they are in fact intending to fight and to attack the Muslims, at this particular time, the Prophet ﷺ gathered the Muslims together and the narration mentions that there were about 12,000 of the Muslims that had come to Mecca as a part of Fatshu Mecca, the arrival, the, con- the, the conquest, the opening of the city of Mecca. And there were about 2,000 Meccans that volunteered and joined in with them. So that put the total number of their forces at about 14,000. And the Prophet ﷺ organized them together, rallied them up, and the Prophet ﷺ said that we will be marching out from Mecca in the direction of these forces that are gathering to basically deal with the situation that is, you know, formulating, that is coming together. There's a very interesting story here. I had mentioned previously, a few sessions ago, that there was a very interesting individual in Mecca, his name was Safwan ibn Umayyah. Now Safwan ibn Umayyah was the son of one of the leaders of the Quraysh, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, who was a very bitter and a very staunch opponent to the Prophet ﷺ and to the Muslims. And he had at many times, you know, tried to attack the Prophet ﷺ. He would mock and ridicule the Prophet ﷺ. He would insult the Prophet ﷺ and eventually uh, died at the hands of the Muslims. And his son Safwan had kind of taken up the, the Safwan, Ikrima, some of these people, they were kind of the next generation of the leadership of the Quraysh, and they had taken up the mantle of a lot of their fathers and continued this opposition against Islam. So Safwan was amongst them. When the Prophet ﷺ came to the city of Mecca, Safwan had basically fled because he was you know, not willing to accept Islam, and he was actually afraid that, you know, he'd be held accountable for all of his years of opposition against the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims. Safwan inquired and asked about the opportunity to be able to speak to the Prophet ﷺ and seek amnesty. And he was given some hope of the idea that the Prophet ﷺ would be willing to forgive him. When he came to meet the Prophet ﷺ, it was a very remarkable conversation that I shared, that he met the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ told him that you have full amnesty, you're safe, no one will harm you, no one will lay a hand on you. But then he said, okay, I appreciate all of that. However, and the Prophet ﷺ invited him to Islam, he said, I appreciate all of that. However, I'm not really sold on this yet. I'd like, you know, some time to be able to think things over. And the Prophet ﷺ said, take two months to kind of think things over. And the Prophet ﷺ was very comfortable. This was a man that used to lead armies against the Muslims. He was like an active, you know, ad, he was an advocate against Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ allows him to stay in Mecca, safe and sound, and not even accept Islam, not even become Muslim. He's telling the Prophet ﷺ, I'm not convinced of your message yet. And the Prophet ﷺ says, no problem. 
We have more confidence and more faith in our deen. That it is inevitable, it is undeniable, it is unfathomable to us that you would live amongst us and not be persuaded by the truth and the beauty of this religion. So this Safan bin Umayyah, as I mentioned before, he was amongst the nobility and the elite of the Quraysh. So he was a very wealthy individual. So many of the Sahaba, you know, they were still in that situation where they were simple folk. They didn't have a lot of materials, they didn't have a lot of equipment. And so the Prophet ﷺ heard the news that Safwan, um, he possessed a lot of extra equipment. Like in terms of armory, and armor, and weaponry, and things like that, that he possessed a lot of extra equipment. Some narrations mention he possessed, he owned a hundred armors and a hundred like, you know, swords and shields. Like enough equipment to equip. Uh, a hundred soldiers. He was a wealthy man, he had just collected and gathered all of this together, so he had an entire armory to himself. So the Prophet ﷺ called for him, and he was still, it says, Ibn Ishaq says that, فَأَرْسَلَ إِلَيْهِ وَهُوَ يَوْمَ إِذٍ مُشْرِكٍ The Prophet ﷺ called him, and Safan was still a non-believer, he was still a mushrik. He had not accepted Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ said, يَا أَبَا أُمَيَّةَ That was his kunya. He says, إِنَّا سِلَاحَكَ هَذَا نَلْقَ فِيهِ عَدُوَّ نَغَدًا He says that, why don't you lend us your equipment, allow us to borrow your equipment, so that we can go and face our enemy. A lot of our people need equipment, and you have a lot of extra equipment. You have entire armory, entire artillery to yourself. So why don't you let us borrow some of your equipment? And Safwan says, a ghasban ya Muhammad? That's who he is right now. He didn't say, Ya Rasulullah, nothing. Ya Muhammad, I'm not Muslim. You're Muhammad as far as I'm concerned. Sallallahu alayhi wa But he's saying, you're Muhammad to me. He says, A ghasban ya Muhammad? Another narration, he says, Ghasban am ariyatan. He says that, are you forcing me? Are you telling me to hand it over? Like, do I have a choice in the matter? Or are you asking if you can borrow it? Is this a command? Is this an order? Because you're in charge here. I'm at your mercy. So do I have to hand it over or can I borrow it? And the Prophet ﷺ says, بَلْ عَارِيَةً مَضْمُونَةً حَتَّى نُؤَدِّهَا إِلَيْكَ He says, no, rather we just want to borrow it and we shall return it to you. So he says, okay, لَيْسَ بِهَذَا بَأْسٌ he says, no problem, you can borrow it. And so the narration mentions that فَأَطَاهُ مِيَأَةَ دِرْعِينَ He lent them a hundred, enough equipment to equip a hundred soldiers. And so much so that some of the narrations Ibn Ishaq mentions, فَزَعَمُوا I even met some people, Ibn Ishaq says, أَنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ سَعَلَهُ أَنْ يَكْفِيَهُمْ حَمْلَهَا فَفَعَلَ He was also so wealthy that he had like a hundred animals. And the Prophet, like camels or horses. And the Prophet ﷺ even went as far as asking him if they could borrow the animals, and he lent those as well. Now, the reason why I mention this is first of all, you see the humility with which the Prophet ﷺ conducts himself. The Prophet ﷺ has already shown this man quite a bit of mercy. Right? He's, 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 a, he's a criminal. He's attacked, he's murdered, he's killed, he's assassinated Muslims. He's launched multiple attacks against the Prophet ﷺ. He's tried to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. He's a criminal. The Prophet ﷺ already forgave him. Then he's not accepted Islam anyways either. And then the Prophet ﷺ is still asking him. Not taking, asking. Because personal property is personal property. And the Prophet ﷺ always respected the boundaries of personal property. It didn't matter if he was even an enemy. And then secondly, look how he speaks to the Prophet ﷺ. Aghasban ya Muhammad? What, you're just gonna make me, you're just gonna take myself like that, Muhammad? And again, the Prophet ﷺ, look how he responds to such kind of, you know, aggressive or passive-aggressive speech. بَلْ عَارِيَةً مَضْمُونَةً حَتَّى نُؤَدِّهَا إِلَيْكَ No, 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 we would just like to borrow it and we fully guarantee the return of it and we would bring it back to you safe and sound, your equipment. And مَضْمُونَةً basically means if... We're not able to return it to you the way that you gave it to us. We take responsibility for any losses suffered, any losses incurred. We'll repair damages. And so 
but that's the humility of the Prophet sallallahu And the reason why I also bring this up is that the narration basically goes on. Many Imam Ahmad mentions this, Abu Dawood, Nasa'i, Tirmidhi, all the muhaddithun, they mention this in their narrations, that when they got back, we haven't talked about the battle of Hunayn yet, and the battle of Thaqif, the battle of Ta'if, which we'll talk about inshallah, in the coming sessions. But fast forward real quick, to the moment when they get back to Mecca. When they get back to Mecca, the narration mentions, فَضَاعَ بَعْضُهَا Some of the equipment that was lent, did not make it back. And some of it was damaged. It's inevitable. It's battle, it's warfare. And at Hunayn, there was an actual battle. And the Muslims actually did incur and suffer some losses. So inevitable, it's inevitable that something was damaged, something was broken, something was lost. Something did not make it back the way it was taken. فَضَاعَ بَعْضُهَا فَعَرَضَ عَلَيْهِ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ the Prophet ﷺ, he gathered together what was borrowed from him, and the Prophet ﷺ, you know, arranged for it, called him and returned it back to him, and took a full, you know, told him, fully account for everything you had given us. And when they found that there was some things that were missing, the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, please tell me how many things are missing, what their estimated cost is, what that would amount to, and I'd like to compensate you for your losses. Very fair. Again, the Prophet ﷺ, for all intents and purposes, I want everyone to really understand this. We, you know, this is gonna sound very, very strange, but we sometimes, as Muslims, we become so accustomed to the nobility and the character, and the integrity, and the honesty, and the dignity, and the honor of the Prophet ﷺ, that we sometimes start to take this for granted, we don't really appreciate the scope of what's going on. Think about this, the Prophet ﷺ is in charge. He is the head of state, he is the government, he is the ruler, he is the sole authority. He's not just any ruler or any king or any even khalifa, he is a messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He, was, he is sahib al-wahi, sahib al-shari. He receives divine revelation, he is authorized by God to make law. He doesn't have to answer to anyone except Allah. He doesn't have to answer to any human being. He doesn't owe anyone any explanation. But the Prophet ﷺ is here, look at the level of honesty, where they're putting down everything, and they're accounting for everything, and they're checking everything. And the Prophet ﷺ is basically now saying, I owe you something. Please tell me what I owe you. Can you imagine in any other scenario, somebody else with even a modicum of that power, ever subjecting themselves to such accountability? Is it even fathomable to us today? That somebody with even a modicum, an ounce of that level of power, ever being so honest and open to accountability. But that's what, that's what makes the Prophet ﷺ who he is. That's why the Prophet ﷺ was a leader that he was. That's why the Prophet ﷺ commanded and demanded the respect and the love. Not fear, but the love of the people that he governed over. And so the, and then look what happens. You know, goodness, khair begets khair. Goodness inspires more goodness. And so look at Safwan's response. He says, when the Prophet says, What do I owe you? He says, Ana yawm ya Rasulallah. Oh. What did he say a little while ago? Just a few weeks ago. When the Prophet said, Can we borrow some of your equipment? What did he say? Ya Muhammad. What does he say today? Ya Rasulullah. How can you not respect this man? And you know what? It's not that he's Muslim yet. Subhan, that's what's even more amazing. He says, Ana al-yawm ya Rasulullah fil islami arghab. I like Islam a little bit more now. So not Muslim. But he still calls him Ya Rasulullah because he respects the man. How can you not? But he says that, I just feel a greater inclination towards Islam than I did before. And in another narration that explains it in a little bit more detail, that's uh, found in the book of Abu Dawood, he says, the Prophet ﷺ says, قَدْ فَقَدْنَا مِنْ أَدْرَاعِكَ أَدْرَاعًا فَهَلْ نَغْرَمُ لَكَ The Prophet ﷺ said, we lost some of your equipment, 
So can, how can we compensate you for it? Compensate for the damages, the losses. He says, لا يا رسول الله. He says, there is no need, O Messenger of God. إِنَّ فِي قَلْبِي الْيَوْمَ مَا لَمْ يَكُونْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ He says, today I feel differently about you than I did that day. So no need to compensate me for anything. And that's good enough. And this is the effect of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the effect of that dignity. That even in a situation that is obviously very tense, dignity, character, integrity prevails. That's the thing, even when the situation becomes tough, and we do have to take more difficult, you know, challenging measures, more harsher measures. We still never compromise our ethics. We still never compromise our dignity. We still never compromise on our integrity. And that's how what the Quran basically talks about. This is literally, this story, this interaction is a practical demonstration by the Prophet ﷺ of the ayah of the Quran. وَلَا تَسَّوِ الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا سَيِّئَةُ إِدْفَعْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَى كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌ حَمِيمٌ Literally, word to word, it lays out on this situation. It's applied. Because the role of the Messenger as the Qur'an says is, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ That the Qur'an was sent to you so that you may demonstrate it, you may display it and clarify it for the people, so that they understand what has been given to them. That this is the ayah that I was referencing from Surah 41, Surah Fusilat, is Allah says, good and bad will never be equal. Not all good is equal, not all bad is equal, and good and bad will never be equal. Always respond with something better. And what will happen? All of a sudden, inexplicably, miraculously, your most bitter rival and enemy will become your more pa most passionate and loyal friend and supporter. And that's literally what we see play out over here. So as I was mentioning, that the Prophet ﷺ, at this particular time, um, they march out, and the, as I mentioned, that there were about 14,000 people in the Muslim forces. Some narrations mentioned that there were 12,000 forces, but Ibn Kathir ta'ala says, there were 12,000 that had come from the conquest of Mecca, plus the 2,000 Meccans. So either way, there's some conversation between 12,000 or 14,000. Nevertheless, they march out. Another very notable thing that I wanted to mention that I feel is very relevant and something we can learn a lot from, is that the person the Prophet ﷺ left in charge of Mecca while they were gone to take care of this threat at the place of Hunayn was a companion of the Prophet ﷺ who was from the people of Mecca. His name was Atab ibn Asid ibn Abil Aiz ibn Umayya ibn Abd shams al-Umawi. So Atab ibn uh, Asid radiallahu ta'ala anhu. What's, why, why is that noteworthy? His name is probably not something that most you know, folks have heard before. They haven't heard his mention before. But why is it mentioned? Why is it noteworthy? Why should it be mentioned? Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala does some research on the individual. And he tells us, وَكَانَ عُمْرُهُ إِذَّاكَ قَرِيبًا مِنْ عِشْرِينَ سَنَةً He was only 20 years old. Only 20 years old. And the Prophet put him in charge of Makkah, the Haram. You take care of the Haram. You take care of Makkah. You take care of the Kaaba of Baytullah while we're gone. 20 years old. You know, a lot of times we have these expressions where we say, put your money where your mouth is. Right? So we talk a lot of times about the importance of young people and our youth and cultivating young people and future leadership and the youth, the leaders of tomorrow, etc., etc. These are all great slogans. And it's very, fa it's fantastic rhetoric. Particularly when we're fundraising, it sounds fantastic. But putting your money where your mouth is, that not only saying it from a stage when you wanna kinda, you know, take money from people, but actually doing it in our communities. Who are we empowering? You know, training, teaching, empowering, preparing, giving responsibility to, you know, getting them ready. When it, whenever it comes down to any type of critical responsibility, we always default back to our comfort zone. And it's really, I, I, I don't want to get into, you know, um, vilifying, you know, kind of the, the status quo leadership in our communities, the older folks, I'm not vilifying them. 
I don't think there's anything nefarious there, at least not for the most part. But a lot of times it's just a matter of the comfort zone. What is familiar is comfortable, is safe. But that's not the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. You gotta give to get. You gotta invest something. You gotta, you, 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 you have to put something into it. You have to put something on the line. And that really creates pressure and actual responsibility. It is something that really breeds and fosters confidence. When they actually will succeed. And this is the Prophet ﷺ teaching us this. Alright? And then lastly and finally, uh, before I conclude for today, inshallah, I'm gonna keep it a little bit shorter today. Um, but the last thing I wanted to mention, because I was talking about the way the Prophet ﷺ led people. And now we see a couple of different things. I've mentioned two different things here. Number one, the honesty, the integrity, the dignity, the honor of the Prophet ﷺ, and how he treated people in such a dignified fashion. And number two is how the Prophet ﷺ saw the potential in people. And he empowered people, and encouraged people, and lifted them up, brought them up. Then what type of response did that elicit from the people? How dedicated were they? That the narration mentions that the prophets, uh, the Muslims, when they marched out from the city of Mecca, they stopped at, the first place that they stopped at, when they stopped there, and they kind of set up camp over there, the Prophet ﷺ, they were getting ready to pray. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said that, you know, when it was nighttime, the Prophet ﷺ said, مَن يَحْرُسُنَا اللَّيْلَةَ Who will guard us, protect us, kind of keep a lookout for the Muslim encampment at night? So, Anas ibn Abi Marthad, another young companion of the Prophet ﷺ said, Ana ya Rasulullah, I will. The Prophet ﷺ said, Farqab. And the Prophet ﷺ specifically told him, Istaqbal hadha shi'ab, uh, hadha shi'ab hatta takuna fi a'lahu, wa la nugharranna min qibalika al-laylata. The Prophet ﷺ said, specifically go out and keep watch in this direction, and no attack should come at us from that side. Meaning, you keep watch. <clears throat> and if you see any movement, if you see any trouble stirring, you gotta come and let us know. Do not let us get caught off guard. He says, okay, I got it. And he rides out at night, before everyone kind of like wraps up and turns in. Morning time comes, everybody wakes up for Fajr, they gather together, they're about to pray Fajr, and the Prophet ﷺ says, هَلْ أَحْسَسْتُمْ فَارِسَكُمْ Has anyone see, seen Anas? Has anyone seen the young man who was keeping watch? Everyone says, Ya Rasulullah, مَا أَحْسَسْنَا We haven't seen him, we haven't heard from him, nothing. The Prophet ﷺ says, okay, it's time for prayer. They pray the salah. And as soon as they get done praying, the narration says that the Prophet ﷺ immediately turns in that direction. And he's kind of looking off in that direction. He's worried. Where is he? And then all of a sudden, the Prophet ﷺ sees him riding up in the distance. And he says, Abshiru, فَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ فَارِسُكُمْ Oh, good news, good news. He's here. And when he comes to the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ asks him, how did everything go? And he says, I went out there, I stayed alert, I kept an eye out, I didn't see any movement, I didn't see any trouble. The Prophet ﷺ says, Did you take any rest? Did you take any rest at night at all? Did you take any breaks? And he says, لا إلا مصليًا أو قاضي حاجتين. He said, absolutely not. I only went to the restroom, and then I, you know, maybe we'll do, and then I just prayed in between a little bit here and there. But outside of that, I didn't take any rest. I just stayed alert the whole time. That dedication, right? We oftentimes complain that we don't find dedication. We don't find commitment. We don't find people willing to work hard, roll up their sleeves. But we will if we put them in that position. If we cultivate that sense of responsibility. If we tell, let them know that we do trust them. This is the way the Prophet ﷺ fostered this sense of investment, ownership, empowerment. And then lastly and finally, I know I said that, so that was the last thing, the last thing I just wanted to mention, and this is kind of something that we can end on, a very powerful kind of message from the Prophet ﷺ. While they were traveling towards the direction of Hunayn, and the narration mentions that the 2,000 Meccans that had joined with the Muslims, many of them were still very new to Islam. They had left idol worship not too long ago. 
And while they were traveling, they passed by a place where there was this very, you know, kind of luscious tree. And there were some people there, some Bedouins kind of in the area, that used to worship that tree. They used to go there and offer sacrifices there and do some rituals there at that tree. When some of these people who had just very recently come to Islam, they kind of saw this and they said, Ya Rasulullah, اِجْعَلْ لَنَا ذَاتَ أَنْوَاتٍ كَمَا لَهُمْ ذَاتُ أَنْوَاتٍ They said, oh, Messenger, of Allah, Messenger of Allah, can we have an object of worship the way these people have an object of worship? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, قُلْتُمْ وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ بِيَدِهِ كَمَا قَالَ قَوْمُ مُوسَى لِمُوسَى He says, what's really re- astonishing what you just said to me, I swear to Allah, what you just said to me is exactly what the believer said to Moses. Exactly the same. And he quoted the ayah from Surah Al-A'raf, اِجْعَلْ لَنَا إِلَهًا كَمَا لَهُمْ آلِهَا Make for us an object of worship, a deity. Make for us an object of worship as these people have. قَالَ إِنَّكُمْ قَوْمٌ تَجْهَلُونَ And Musa alayhi salam had said to them, that you are people who are still stuck in your ignorant ways. And then the Prophet ﷺ issued a warning, and this hadith is found in Tirmidhi, Nasa'i, many books of hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّهَا sunan." These are the events of the past in history. لَتَرْكَبُنَّ سُنَنَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ And if you're not careful, you will step for step, fall into the same pitfalls that the people before you did. You'll make the same mistakes the people before you did. And that's why it's so important to know your history, to learn your history, and to be mindful, to be aware, to be vigilant, and not fall into those same mistakes. That's why the Qur'an is the treasure that it is. Because it tells us what to avoid, what to look out for, what mistakes not to make. What is the path to salvation? What are the errors of the ways of the people of the past? So that we don't end up making those same mistakes again. And so inshallah with this, uh, we'll go ahead and conclude for this week. As I said, keeping it uh, just a little bit shorter inshallah. And uh, we'll resume from here in the following session where we'll actually talk about the commencement. Where the battle actually commences and what happens in the battlefield. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that's been said and heard. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallah bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasakfirika wa natubu ilayka.